I want to start off simply with an old story. A lady from the city decided to take a tour of the farm. These working farms sometimes will do tours for, for people, just make a little extra income. And the lady decided to take a tour because she was kind of curious how this worked. And they went, took them through the barns and all the things that are, are around and took them through the dairy and how to make milk. And as they came out of the barn, she looks across and goes, how come that cow doesn't have horns? He says, well, you know, that's a very good question. You see, there are some cows called Guernsey cows that are born without horns. And some of the cows, because when we milk them, we don't want to get gored, we'll take and cut the horns off. Don't worry, it doesn't hurt them. In fact, some of the young ones, when they start to develop their horns, we'll take a little bit of acid and put it right on the tips of the stubs. And it prevents the horns from growing. And that's just for our protection. He said, now, that one out there, that one's a little different. You see, that one out there is called a horse. Now, that had very little to do with my lesson, other than the fact that it made some of you smile. And that's what this lesson's about today. Today, we are going to talk about hope. I asked Tad to lead that song. I know it's a song we don't sing here very often because it is kind of a longer one and a little bit of a trickier one. But it's a wonderful, wonderful song of hope. And what I want to do today is bring you God's message of hope for you. You see, right now, <laughs> this world is... <laughs> It's worried. It's gone crazy. It's under stress. It's afraid. Fear is everywhere. I work at a grocery store part-time, and I see it every morning when I go to work. A store opens at 6. There's a long line of people trying to get toilet paper and water and some of the things they think are necessary to survive because they're afraid. And you can see the fear in their eyes. But even here in the church, the effect of the pandemic are felt. As you can see, we have very few people here this morning, and understandably so. We have an older congregation, a congregation that has a lot of people with high risk, and they're making a good, wise choice to stay home. That's why we're doing the live video feeds. But it doesn't mean that they don't have any less fear. So what I want to do today is just give you a lesson of hope, bring you God's message to you about hope so that it'll help us ease our concerns a little bit and maybe give us a little more peace as we go through the week. First thing is, God wants you to know that you are loved. Sometimes I know this <laughs> when you're in this world and it seems like the world's against us and nobody really loves us. Like nobody seems to really love anybody. <laughs> and, and it's kind of a bad feeling not knowing if you're loved. And that's what happens when we get fear and stress in our lives is we begin to forget some of the basic things that we have been taught. But you see, we are loved by God. It's the verse we, everyone knows. We've seen it over and over again at sporting events. There's always some, I want to say nut, but maybe not, guy who stands up with a sign in the back, John 3.16. He's telling you, don't forget, you are loved. John 3.16 and 17 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You see, God the Father loves us so much, he put together this plan. And he knew it would be the sacrificing of Jesus Christ. But he loved us so much, he went ahead with the plan. And his son, Jesus Christ, loves us so much that he went through with it. 
He understood the pain of the people. He understood their loss because we have been separated from God by sin. And that only through salvation can we come back, that perfect sacrifice. And even though he knew what he was in for when he prayed, Father, not my will, but yours. He did it anyway because he loved us. The Holy Spirit loves us so much that he has been sent to us as a comforter. He sees our pain. He feels our pain. He helps comfort us during those times. We are loved by God. But not just God. We are loved by each other. In John chapter 13, the verse 34, a new commandment I give you that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you are you also are to love one another. By this, all the people will know that you are my disciples if you love, if you have love for one another. As Christians, this is what we do. We weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. Because we love each other. You know that when you're feeling down and sad, or maybe there's been a loss in the family, you can count on our brothers and sisters to call, send a letter, a postcard, stop by and say, I just want to let you know I was thinking of you. Are you okay? Is there anything we can do to help? Why? Because we love you. It's that love that sustains us. It's that love that gets us through those tough times. At the end of services during the, the invitation, we always offer an opportunity for those who are struggling with a certain sin that need their prayers to the brothers and sisters to come forward. That is an act of love. We all show our love for that person. And they show our love, frankly, by coming forward and trusting us to pray for them. This is what love is all about. Care and concern for each other. So during these troubled and trying times, please don't forget, you are loved. There's also times, though, I feel like you were the only person on an island. <laughs> Bills weighing down on you, maybe some personal problems pounding away at you. You just feel like there's nobody left in the world but you. And all of the world's wrath is focused right at you. I know I have. But you know what? You're not alone. You are never alone. I know sometimes we feel like we can be forgotten. I know there have been times in the past where I had back issues. And I couldn't make it to services, I couldn't make it to work. And because everybody got busy with this life, which happens unfortunately, we get so wrapped up in this life we forget to see what's around us. I never got a phone call. I didn't get that lifeline of love that I could have used. And I felt all alone. I had forgotten that God loved me. I had forgotten that my brothers and sisters really did love me. They just had got wrapped up in their lives. But the truth is, I was never alone. One of my favorite songs, Where No One Stands Alone. Let me give you a little background why that song is so important to us. Juan and I, when we got married, we were married in Eureka, California. 
Her family was there. My mom and brother were up there. And we were both working at Montgomery Wards. I uh, don't see too many young people. Montgomery Wards was an old department store that's now defunct. Most of you, I think, probably remember it. We used to call it Monkey Wards. And two weeks after we were married, in fact, the, I think it was the first day back to work after our wedding, when I got back from the honeymoon, I was told that there were massive layoffs and that I was being transferred back to my hometown of Bakersfield. Not as traumatic for me as it was for Wanda. She was leaving everything she ever knew. She had never left that town. And she was moving to a strange new place. Fortunately, when we got there, she found out what love and not ever being alone is. My Christian family took her in as if they'd known her all her life. They welcomed me back with open arms, which I kind of expected they would. I didn't burn too many bridges. <laughs> and over the next 15 years, we developed a relationship with them that was not just church members, was beyond friends. They were family. In fact, you know two of them because they come here every once in a while. Steve and Sherry Richardson, my brother from another mother. Tom Padgett, who was with him just a couple months ago when they both came. He's another one. We are family. After being there a while, my son developed allergies to tumbleweeds of all things, which if you know anything about Bakersfield, that's the national flower of Bakersfield. <laughs> During the spring in March, the tumbleweeds are blowing everywhere. And he was going to have to have shots. And back then, those shots were so dangerous, he had to stay in the doctor's office for an hour afterwards in case of any side effects. Not just the first time, but every time. I couldn't bring myself to put my son through that. So I got transferred to Time Warner Cable in Memphis to get him away from the tumbleweeds. The last song I led before leaving Pioneer Drive was where no one stands alone. You thought I was blubbering a couple weeks ago when we had a baptism? Oh, you should have seen me then. It was bad. <laughs> because I was leaving my family. But we went to Memphis to the Burlington Drive congregation. And I found out I have family in Tennessee. And they loved me too. And they were there for me. Because you see, we are never alone in this life. God is always with us. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, it says it as plain as you can say it. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. God is always there. He was there for Moses. Told Moses the same thing. Told Joshua the same thing. And he's told us the same thing. I will never leave you or forsake you. So when we have those times of trouble, we need to have the confidence to know he's right there with us. But not only God, we're here for each other. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap. If we do not give up, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. That's what we do as Christians. We help each other. We do good. We encourage. We provide. I've mentioned this before that at a time when I was out of work for quite a while, the church there in Bakersfield took, to, uh, took up a collection to help me pay my bills. And they 
showed up with a carload of food so my family wouldn't go hungry. And when the opportunity came around that someone else needed help, I was able then to step up and help them. Because that's what we do as family. That's what we do when we love each other. That's what we do as Christians. Is we do good. We do God's work. We are here to help one another through those troubling times so that no one should ever feel like they're alone. Because the truth is, we never are. Not only are we loved, not only are we never alone, but we are cared for. Do you realize that? And during these troubling times, we can get caught up in all of Satan's lies that nobody will ever take care of you. You're on your own. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. The truth is, we are well cared for. And sometimes we just forget it. In the book of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says that God will take care of us. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of the sinful desires. He has granted to us his precious and great promises. He has given us everything we need to live in this life and to be godly. And he does it through his word and through prayer and through each other. You see, when I was struggling before, and I mentioned that the church came up with some money, it was actually spearheaded by one man. His name was Oscar. And he went around and talked to everybody, and he got the money together, and he was the one who loaded up his car with food. But see, he was the answer to a prayer that I had given to God asking for help because I knew how tough it was. Oscar had that privilege to help God answer my prayer. You realize that? When you do good for someone else, you are helping God answer someone's prayer. That's why we care for each other. We know God cares for us. He provides us everything. But did you know we care for each other? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. What a wonderful, wonderful thing Jesus Christ has given to us in the church. Because of his death, we come together to worship him. We come together to sing praise to him. We come together to love him. But we also come together to help each other. To love each other. To encourage each other. to care for each other. I love, I love Hebrews 10.24. It says, consider one another and how to provoke one another into love and good works. To consider means I have to know you. I have to think about you. And say, how can I help them? 
How can I make their life a little bit better? How can I provoke them to love? How can I encourage them to good works? I can do it with my good works. We lead by example. That's why I say 1025 that says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together talks about the congregation coming together like this, yes. But it's so much more. Don't let this be the only time we ever see each other. Because the more we get to know each other, we have singings at people's houses and we'll, we'll get back to singings. And we have potlucks at each other's houses and we will get back to potlucks. And even when we just call each other on the phone and say, hi, how you doing? I was thinking about you. It lets them know that we care. And that they are cared for. What a beautiful thing we have in the church. But you notice it says not just to everyone, or to anyone, but to everyone. That means your neighbors. They don't have to be Christians for you to care for them. Because in our caring for them, they see the glory of God in us. And we are teaching them through our actions. And it may open the door one day so that they can learn about the plan of salvation and God's wonderful grace. Because we care, not just for Christians, we care for everyone. When I was with Cox Communications in Bakersfield, I was a general sales manager, which meant along with my usual duties, I also had other duties that caused me to travel. I traveled to San Diego and to Ohio and to Atlanta, Georgia, and other places around that needed help. And sometimes I was training, and sometimes people were training me. And sometimes they were just annual meetings. And I got to that point one time where you woke up, stared at the ceiling, and go, where am I? And I forgot where I was at. I knew I wasn't home. I was going, okay, I'm not home. What city am I in? And it took me a few minutes to get it all back together to know exactly where I was. And I'm not going to tell you that those trips weren't fun because I like getting out and meeting new people. I had, I had fun. I enjoyed it. But you know what? There's nothing like going home. I couldn't wait to get back home. You ever done that? Go off on a camping trip and have fun for a week or even for a weekend. But when it's over, you can't wait to get back home again. Because at home, you're safe. At home, you know you're loved. At home, you feel warmth. You see, when this life is over, God has told us, come home. We were created to live in a place with God, a place of paradise, of perfection. Take a look back at Genesis chapter 1, verses 21 through 30, or 29 through 31. This was on the seventh day. And he was talking to man who he had created. And, he, and God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has its breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. He cares for his people. He cares for his creation, including the animals. Verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. That phrase, very good. If you've studied this at all, you know every time up to this point, at the end of each day, he said it was good. But when he finished on the sixth day and it was all done, he said it is very good. 
That word very means holy or completely good. In other words, it was perfect. And he made it for us because he loved us that much. But it was only because of our sin that we were kicked out of the garden. We were kicked out of our house. And because of God's love, he created a plan to bring us home. Part of that plan was that God was calling us to follow him. He kicked us out of the garden because we rebelled against him. He said, you want back? Follow me. Let me show you how to get back there. I want you back there. But you've got to follow me to get there. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope that belongs to your call. We have been called to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. We have been called to follow the examples and teachings of the apostles. We have been called. Why have we been called? Because God is calling us home. I was always impressed by the parable of the uh, prodigal son. Because just like the prodigal son, we had it all. We were at home, well taken care of, loved. And because of our sin, we left. Not his choice, our choice. We left because of our actions. But the whole time he was gone, the father was looking out the door. It says that when, the, when he was still far off, the father saw him. You know the father was looking for him. When are you coming home? And he would walk by that door and stop and no. And later he come by and stop and no. Until finally one day he stopped and looked at that door and went, he's here, he's coming home. And what a glorious praise and celebration when he came home. And it's the same for us. When we follow him, we are coming home to one of the greatest celebrations the, the world has ever seen. The angels in heaven rejoice. Revelations 26, or 22, 16 and 17. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things from the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. The spirit of the bride says, come. And let the one who hears says, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. And the one, let the one who desires take the water of life without price. He's calling us home. He's standing at the doorway. I've prepared mansions for you. I've prepared perfection for you. If you want to read in Revelation, it's talking about the New Jerusalem. You'll see it talks about the river that runs through the heart of the city. And on either side of the river is the tree of life from the Garden of Eden. In other words, it's home. The home we were kicked out of, the home that we left because of our behavior, because of the choices that we have made. He says, come home. Follow me and come home.
This is my message of hope from God to you this morning. I hope this puts a smile on your face. I hope this warms your heart. I hope this helps you get through those troubling times when all seems lost. Because you are never alone. You are loved by God and by all of us. And not only is God with you, we are with you. And you are cared for, not just by God, but by all of us. And when this is all over, hallelujah, we get to go home. What a wonderful day that will be.